Hello, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Can I get a little wave? All right, you guys are paying attention, awesome. Well, my name is Christelle Acevedo and I'm the Spiritual Formation Director here at Transformation Church. And tonight we are having our very first Theology Nights, yay! Um, and so I want you to take a look around the room right now because when I look at this amazing group of people, I see multi-ethnic, I see multi-generational, and the fact that you're here means that you're also mission-shaped. You want to learn about the mission of God and be shaped by that. Otherwise, you wouldn't even be here tonight. So I'm just so excited that we are living out the vision of our church here and that we are seeking to be loved completely by God and to love ourselves correctly and to love others compassionately. And it starts here, right? Like we are here um, not because we wanna be really um, smart scholars. This is not like for like the, all the people who um, are at a high level and we just can't attain that. Like, no, we are all theologians. Theology is really the study of God, what we believe about God. So if you have any kind of belief about God and who God is, you're studying theology. You're a theologian. And so if you have any um, discomfort or um, insecurity, just leave that at the door and just come and, and recognize that this is a moment of worship, that this is not just studying just to attain knowledge or just to make ourselves have big heads. That is not the goal. The goal is to love God and to learn more about who God is and to learn more about how what God has called us to shapes who we are and shapes how we live in our communities. And so you're here, so take a breath. I know that it's Thursday. Maybe you've had a long week. So I just want you guys to take a breath right now. Let's do it. One, two, three. We're going to breathe in and then breathe out, okay? One, two, three. <sighs> there, doesn't that feel good? All right, so when you walked in, you received your notebooks, so make sure that you take notes. If you need pens, there's pens on the, the backs of the seats, um, so make sure that you grab one there. Pastor Derwin has been dreaming about doing something like this for many years, and so the fact that we get to partner together and present this opportunity for discipleship to you um, is, is, a, is a God thing. And so we are so thrilled that you all have said yes to the invitation, um, not only from us, but from God, because we are all invited to get to know who God is. He wants to have an intimate relationship with you. And so we get to study the scriptures so that we can grow in that. Amen? Yeah. Amen. That means you agree. If you said amen, it means you agree. Um, so I'm going to pray really quickly, and then Pastor Derwin is going to come out and take it away. And when he's done with his teaching, we're going to have a Q&A. So when you registered for this event, many of you submitted questions. So we looked through them, and we picked some of the most frequently asked questions, put them together, and Pastor Derwin is going to have an opportunity to give you those answers. So make sure you stick around, and you should also be receiving more information about the next Theology Nights and just some of the other fun things that we have planned. Sound good? Okay, so I'm going to pray for us, and then Pastor Derwin is going to come out. God, I just thank you so much that you have brought us to this moment, that you have brought us through the week, that you have gathered us together in this place so that we could learn a little bit more about who you are. Because when we get to know you, we get to worship you more as we love you with our hearts, with our souls, with our minds, God. We have an opportunity to worship you because all of life is worship. Whether we're singing on Sunday morning, whether we're tucking our kids into bed at night, whether we're working throughout the week or whether we're opening up your scripture and studying the Trinity, it's all worship. And so we thank you for the opportunity. We thank you for Pastor Derwin and um, the wisdom that you have given him as he has studied your word and the fact that he now gets to share that with us, Lord. And so open our hearts, open our minds as we receive your word. We thank you and we love you in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, can we give Christelle a team and the spiritual formation team and Vicki leading that team? So it's so good to see everybody. So um, this is what we're going to do. We 
are going to dive into this. And Christelle did such a great job of laying the foundation. This really flows into upward, inward, outward, right? It's like, I, I want to love God with all of my heart, with all of my soul, with all of my mind, and with all of my strength. Why? So that we, in turn, can love ourselves correctly, which moves us to love our neighbors compassionately. Love God, love self, love neighbor. And so it begins with the nature and the person of who God is. So theology nights. Why discovering the Trinity matters? Why discovering the Trinity matters? So one of the questions I'm going to knock out before it is a question uh, if you've ever been to the black barbershop, I really want to encourage you to go, even if you're not black. It is, it is epic. And some of the conversations you'll hear about philosophy and life and music, and they'll argue LeBron James and Jordan all day long. It is, it is amazing. But someone will inevitably say, well, well, the word Trinity ain't in the Bible. That's true. But the word Bible ain't in the Bible either. So just because something is not in the Bible doesn't mean that the Bible does it, the name of it does, is not taught. The word Trinity simply means tri-unity, tri-unity. And so we're going to walk specifically through just a few New Testament scriptures, just a few. Or if I did more, this would be an eight-month class. But what I did do is way back in the year 2000, I was a young whippersnapper, and I was excited for Jesus, and I wanted everybody to know him, and I love theology, so I wrote a book that nobody bought. It was 50 pages long, and I was like, let me go back and look at that. So it's kind of cool to go back and look at it and see how God has grown you, and I was like, I'm going to use all of this. So a lot of what you're going to see uh, comes from that, but also I took those 50 pages and I turned them into 30, and you'll be able to get them and read them. You're here because you want to know, and so you'll be able to read some of my early thoughts, but I was like, man, this just nails it. So that'll be available to you because we can't possibly cover everything in this time, but what I want to do is give us some workable, what's called applied theology, because James 2.19 says that even the demons know about God. So demons can know about God, but not follow him. And so we don't want to be people who simply know about God. We actually want to know him. Learning theology Theos, Greek word for God, ology, study. Learning theology is not simply about studying God. It's about participating in the very life of God. That when we come to faith through Jesus, because of the Father, via the Holy Spirit's drawing power, we begin to participate in the very life of God. God not only forgives us, but he shares life with us. The Bible calls that being born again. We are regenerated. So here's a question for us. Number one, why do we long for love and community? Even when you look at, say, vicious gangs, they'll be like, man, I love you. We, we long for community. We, we long for people to see us. We, we long for relationship. Where, where does that come from? Well, because we are made in the image and likeness of the one true God, who is love and who has existed in an eternal community of self-giving love. So let me pause here. To be made in the image and likeness of God does not mean a literal physical representation. Because the testimony of Scripture is that God is spirit. God is also infinite. We are finite. We have parts. God does not have a part. So to be made in the image and likeness of God is simply to mean that we have the capacity to reflect him in the world. Also, 
when you looked at kings in the ancient middle uh, uh, Mediterranean world, they always had statues of themselves in their cities to remind people, I'm the king. Well, Adam and Eve were living statues to remind creation who God was, and they were the image forth God's glory throughout the world. But God has existed in an eternal community of self-giving love. Where do we get this from? Let's look at 1 John 4, 8. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. So let's pause here. If there's one person and you exist eternally and you're by yourself, who are you gonna love? If you're by yourself, who are you gonna love? There's no one to love. So with the doctrine in Islam, Allah is one solitary being, so he's not called love because eternally there would be no one to love. So God himself has always existed in a community of love. And notice what the scripture says. It doesn't say God has love. It says that God is love. God's essential nature, his essential character is love. Love is who God is. Love is what God does. But also keep in mind that love is also just. Love is righteous. Love is Jesus telling Peter, get behind me, Satan. So, so God is love. So the Father's the lover, the Son is the lovee, and the Holy Spirit is the spirit of love. And so God has eternally existed in a love relationship. So you know what that means? It means he's never been lonely. There's never been a moment that God went, I'm just so lonely. Let me, let me create these little creatures. No, no, no. When God creates us, it's an invitation to go, you can experience the love that me, the Son, and the Spirit have eternally experienced. Well, let's dive into some text here. My old mentor, Dr. Norman Geisler, he taught me Thomistic philosophy and Christian apologetics and theology, and he didn't waste words. Every word mattered. So I got this from him. There is one God. So, so, so the Jewish faith, the Judeo-Christian faith, is built on what's called monotheism. Everybody say that on the count of three. One, two, three. Monotheism. We believe that there is one God. In the Old Testament, one of the words for God or names for God is Elohim. And even Elohim is a singular but has pluralness to it. So we have hints of it in what we call the Old Testament, which you'll be able to read about. But, but there is only one God. There are three distinct persons who are God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's pause here. The term person is a anthropomorphic term. It's a way for us to understand God. Like, like God is not a man. Everybody understand that, right? because he's described also as a chicken and you come under his wings. So we know God's not a giant, infinite chicken. That would be weird. But these are terms that we can understand, Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that there is one being who exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let me give you a visual illustration, and this is the best illustration I've ever seen. I got it from Dr. Geisler studying for uh, uh, my undergrad, I mean my uh, master's. And so one God revealed in three persons. So if you look at a triangle, right, you'll see it has three distinct points. If you remove a point, it is no longer a triangle. There's one triangle, three points. There's one God revealed as Father, Son, and the Spirit. And what we're going to talk about on the next theology night, though we'll touch a little bit, is how Jesus... God the eternal son is 100% God the son and 100% man. That's called the hypostatic union. So when we go to the new heavens, new earth, and we see Jesus, he's going to still be in his hypostatic union state of a Jewish glorified man with nails pierced in his hands while simultaneously being eternally God the son. If you're confused by that, if you're struggling with that, welcome. 
Because if you and I could figure that out exhaustively, I don't think we would have a very, very big God. So we see the triangles here. So when people communicate to you, this is a really, really good visual. So the Bible teaches us, and we're only looking at the New Testament. The Old Testament I have written, so you'll be able to read that. The Father is called Theos. The Father is called God. Where do we get that from? 1 Peter chapter 1, 3 through 5. And this is just one of a multitude of verses, like a mountain of verses. Peter says this, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Wow, man, ooh, I'm a preacher, but I got to keep going. I hope you just eat that up right there. O-M to the G. And, in, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. So, so we see that, that God the Father is called God. Well, what about Jesus? Can you continue the text? This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. All right? So now we're going to see that Jesus, the Son, is also called that same God. Now remember, the Son is not the Father, and the Father is not the Son, nor the Father, the Son is the Holy Spirit. Three distinct persons, just like three points to a triangle, but one God. One God revealed in three persons. What does it say about Jesus? This text right here is very, very dear to me. Um, I grew up in a home that had a Jehovah's Witness influence. Uh, if you've been around TC, you know how much I love my grandmother. Me and Granny was like this. But she had a Jehovah's Witness background. Now, they kicked, the Jehovah's Witnesses kicked her out because she used to like to smoke cigarettes and cuss. So she kind of like made her own like group and she held all the tenants. And one of the things was, uh, after I had gotten a little education and studied a little bit of Greek, she would go, well, this scripture in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. It shouldn't say that. It should say, and the word was a God. And I was like, well, Granny, you can't write that in the Greek language. Boy, I don't care what the Greek language sounds like, but Granny, that's how they wrote the Bible in Koine Greek. It didn't fall out of the sky in King James. It, it was written in Koine Greek. So this text is really important to me. In the beginning was the logos, the word. So, so this is speaking of Jesus, the, the logos, the word, the creative genius, and the word was with God. So let's pause here. This little word here in Greek is the word pros, P-R-O-S. It's a beautiful word. What it describes is almost like a dance. The early church fathers in the 200 um, A.D. and so forth, would say that the eternal community of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were dancing a dance of love. It is a dynamic moving toward. So this text is telling us that the word Jesus and God were moving towards each other in this self-giving love, and the word was, and the word was God. Another text, John 8, 5, 8, and 59. Jesus was having um, a beef, a conversation, a disagreement with the religious establishment. And he has the ultimate mic drop moment. Verily, verily, I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, ego and me. Not lego my waffle. Ego and me. I am. First of all, one of the reasons why we teach and preach the way we do here is because we want to know the full story of God. For the Jewish people, Abraham was Father Abraham. And Jesus, this, this country bumpkin from the wrong side of the tracks in Nazareth, is standing up like, yeah, before Abraham was, <clears throat> and go with me, I am. Why is that a big deal? Let's see verse 59. At this, they picked up stones to stone him. Why would they do that? Why would they throw stones at Jesus for just saying before Abraham was, I am? Because they knew exactly what he was saying. 
In Exodus chapter 3, oh, wait, I'm going to pull it up here in a minute. But Jesus hid himself slipping away from the temple grounds. Isn't that so dope? Dope means good. He does it at the temple, y'all. He does it at the temple. The temple for the Jewish people is where heaven and earth meets. And Jesus shows up and he's like, he's not in there. I am. Isn't it sad that I am was right in front of them and they missed him? Religion will blind you to the person of Jesus Christ. So let's take a little trek back. We're going to skedaddle back, teenagers. We're going to go back to Exodus 3, 14 and 15. So this is right as God is raising up Moses to go defeat Pharaoh really quickly. The 10 plagues against Pharaoh was the defeat of the 10 gods of Egypt. The last god of Egypt is the Pharaohs thought they were sons of Ra, the sun god, thus their sons Pharaoh's sons was a son of God. God hardened Pharaoh's heart by giving him mercy, meaning Pharaoh could have repented at any time, but he took advantage of God's mercy when God would relent, and it made his heart harder. God didn't like, I'm going to make your heart hard. God was loving him so much and so merciful to him when he should have given him judgment, and he gave him mercy, and Pharaoh stiff-armed that, and the more he stiff-armed that, and the more he rejected it, the harder his heart got. But here's the invitation for Moses. God replied to Moses, I am who I am. This is, this is Yahweh. In the Hebrew language, this is called the tetragramnation. You can write that down if you want tetragramnation, and it means the four vowels. And in English, the closest we can get is Yah or Yahweh. In German, it's Jehovah. But what it means is self-existent, eternal, mighty one. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. For God also said to Moses, say this to the Israelites, the Lord, Adonai, this is a replacement for I am, Adonai, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. Now do you see why they wanted to stone Jesus? Jesus perfectly knew what he was doing. So you know what this means? When your Jehovah's Witnesses friends corner you or somebody on their little TikTok telling you how the Trinity's not true, you have information to be able to reach people with that. By the time my grandmother passed away, I was able to share a lot of this with her. And before she passed, a year before she passed, she was like, I believe that Jesus is the eternal son of God. As Jehovah's Witnesses, they believe Jesus is a created being called Michael. But before she went on to see Jesus face to face, she got it. It's not about arguing or debating. It's about asking good questions, but it's about you being equipped and taking people on a journey. Now, what about the Holy Spirit, though? Good question. Glad you asked. This is my name forever. This is how I'm to be remembered in every generation. Okay. The Holy Spirit is God. Now, let me pause here. The Holy Spirit is not electricity. Bzz. God, the Holy Spirit, is a person, mind, will, emotions within the nature of God. The Holy Spirit is not weird. He's not chaotic. He's the one who brings us life. He's the one who gives us fruit of the Spirit. He's the one who gives us power to follow Jesus. So Jesus in his humanity, everything Jesus did in his humanity was through the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus did not resist sin and went, I am God, I resist sin. No, it's through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, you might laugh at this, but this is a legit scenario. I'm just saying what I'm about to say next. So imagine Jesus grows up. They hear stories about him, 12 years old. He was at the temple. I mean, he was telling the religious leaders, I'm at my father's business. And rumors were going around like this is a good Jewish boy. You don't think them Jewish girls was like, hey, Mary, how your son doing? How Jesus doing? I hear he worked with his hands, too. He ain't even never sinned. Ladies, how many of you want to marry a man that ain't never sinned and worked hard as a carpenter and love like that? 
So you don't think they went after Jesus? Jesus walked in the power of the Holy Spirit to live and move the way he did. He didn't go, oh, I'm being tempted, so let me put on my God card. When he was tempted by Satan in Matthew uh, uh, 4, what did, he, what did he do? As it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. So Jesus is not only Savior, but he's our example. Not only is he our Savior and example, he's the one who indwells us. And he says, stop trying and start dying so I can live through you. God, the Holy Spirit is God. Let's go to Hebrews 9.14. If we ever do a coffee shop, it's going to be called Hebrews. How much more then will the blood of Christ, here it is, y'all, through the eternal spirit, the Father is eternal, the Son is eternal, the Holy Spirit is eternal. Why? Because God is one eternal being revealed in three persons, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God cleanses our consciousness from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. Okay, this is for free. In the Old Testament, go to, when you get home, go to Exodus 3.10, 3.9, somewhere off in there, and what you're gonna read before the great I am speaks out of the burning bush, it's gonna say, and the angel of the Lord went into the bush, and God said. That's called a Christophany or a theophany. That is an Old Testament appearance of Christ Jesus. Remember when, when, when uh, Isaac was wrestling with God and he had a limp? He was, it, th those are pictures of Christ. Remember when God created, and it was like a dove over the darkness, there's the Holy Spirit. And so, but in my paper, you'll have all that. We just don't have time right now, but I just wanted to just throw that out there because I just couldn't help myself. All right, teenagers, look at this. God is one being that eternally exists in three co-equal, co-eternal persons. So the definition, the one true God, Yahweh, is one being that eternally exists in three co-equal co-eternal persons. Well, what does this have to do with our, you know what, I gotta pause. And the Holy Spirit is just beating me up up here. So way back at Forest Hill Church, uh, Vicky and I taught a class similar to this. Praise God those people survived. When I think back at my old sermons, they're probably like, whew. But there was a teenage girl in there, she was really smart, and she was learning about doctrine and theology, and then she went off to college, and uh, she had an ethnically Jewish background, so she never felt like she fit in, but she went off to college and became an atheist, and years later, Vicky and I sat down to meet with her, and she was just a whole, totally just different person. So listen, this is not merely about intellect. This is not just an intellectual game. This is about knowing and loving the God who has known and loved you. For me personally, the atheist position, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. There's too much evidence, not only intellectually, but relationally. But what happened, though, is her... Mom and dad had a really bad relationship, and I think that played a part into it as well. And so this is a whole big thing. But to the teenagers, when you go off to college, oftentimes we will find an intellectual reason for a moral barrier we want to break. And let me tell you something. Jesus is better. He is so much better. So when those moments come, remember my voice, but more importantly, remember that the living God of the universe, the Father, Son, and the Spirit loves you, and he is better. Okay, I can continue now. All right, so how are we saved? How are we saved? The Greek word sozo. Matter of fact, talk to your other Christian friends at other churches and be like, so tell me about so-so. They'll be like, Sammy Sosa? 
<laughs> the Greek word for saved is, is sozo, and it's, it's, it's used in three ways, past, present, and future. I've been saved, justification. I'm being saved, sanctification. I will be saved, glorification. I'm saved from the penalty of sin. I'm saved from the power of sin. I'll be saved from the presence of sin. But how are we rescued? Glad you asked. It is through the Trinity. Salvation is the triune, is the triune God's work. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all play a vital role in our salvation. The Father chooses us in Messiah Jesus. He chose us in Messiah Jesus. We're not going to get into this at this time, but I did do a, a sermon on what does the word chosen mean, and it does not mean that God goes, I want you, 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 but the rest of y'all, nah, not so much. Jesus is the chosen one. Jesus was chosen to be the Savior, and all those who place faith in him enter into his chosenness. But let's look at the Father's work here. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ, in Christ. And y'all know on Sundays, I wear this out. If you and I get the depth and the beauty of being in Christ, obedience won't be an issue. If we understand that What's true about Jesus is true about us and the magnitude of that love and the power and the mercy. Obedience becomes a joy. For he chose us, so that's the Father, chose us in him. When? Before the foundations of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Okay, I can't help it. I got to. Okay. Before the foundations of the world, before you and I ever done anything, God decided in Christ that those who operate and have faith in Christ would be in Christ, and those in Christ are holy. That means we're set apart. We, we belong to him. He, he sees us as blameless in his sight. Why are we so guilty then, y'all? Why do we beat ourselves up so much, y'all? Okay, this is going to be some strong medicine. Don't call God a liar, please. When you begin to beat yourself up, you're calling God a liar. You're saying, well, God, you didn't make me holy. Now, you did that for Derwin, but not me. Well, God, you didn't make me blameless. You, you, you did that for somebody else, but not me. Friends, that's narcissism. Even when you don't feel it, believe it. You got to start preaching to yourself. And it don't even matter if you're in a car. People just think you're singing. There are times I'm driving and the enemy tries to come at me. I just start preaching. And you know what I preach? I am righteous. I am forgiven. I am reconciled. I'm a temple of the Spirit. I am who God says I am. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will and to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. There it is, Jesus. We are in Christ. The son redeems us. The word redeem, teenagers, means to buy back. Uh, the word originated in the ancient Israel days and around that time, and it means to be set free from slavery. So when a nation of Israel is set free from slavery in Egypt, it's called redemption. You've been bought back. You've been broken. You've been set free. You've been broken free. So the son, Jesus, redeems us. I love this. Watch this. In him, there it is again. Ooh, Lord, in him. We have redemption. Not we're going to get it, but, but we have it. Through what? His blood. Lord, have mercy through his blood, through his blood. What do we have? The forgiveness of sins. And what sins? Past, present, and future. How do we know? Because he was slain before the foundations of the world. The forgiveness of sins in accordance with what? The riches of God's grace. Our triune God is not broke. He doesn't look in his pockets and go, oh, I'm getting low on grace. Eight, that he lavished on us. Man, Paul was in his bag right here, y'all. He's like, what other words can I describe how epic this is? He, he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. 
He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure. By the way, the mystery is Jew and Gentile together. How do we know? Because that's in chapter 3, Ephesians 3, 5, the multi-ethnic church, bringing people together in him. His will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed, there it is again, in Christ. Now watch this, y'all. To be put into effect when the time reaches their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. This is one of the most slept on verses in the Bible. It's going to be all right. How do we know? Because all things are going to come together in Christ. He's going to make a new heaven and new earth. So we see the Father chooses, the Son redeems, and the Holy Spirit seals us. Here it is again, y'all, in him. It seems like Paul's trying to tell us something. Can I encourage you with, 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 with this? I got to preach just a little bit. Think more about being in him than what you do or don't do. And then you'll find yourself doing more than you ever thought you could do. In him, we're also chosen, having been predestined. Predestined means just to determine beforehand. God has determined beforehand that those who trust Christ will be in Christ. Been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. God is never surprised. In order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of of his glory. If you want to know why you exist, whatever we do is for the play, praise of his glory. And you are also included in Christ. Boy, he says that a lot. I wonder if the congregation's like, he's going to tell us about being in Christ again, guys. And Paul's like, yep. When you heard the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal. Uh-oh. So in the ancient world, right, uh, they didn't have Amazon. They didn't have the post office. Um, they had couriers. And so the couriers would take a message, let's say, from the Caesar or someone of importance. And before they would leave, they would get their ring with their family seal on it, dip it in wax like this, and then they would seal the envelope so that the person receive it would know it hadn't been opened. And so Paul, being a master teacher, is saying this, that through the Father, the Son, and through the Holy Spirit, you have been sealed by the Spirit, that the blood has sealed you, and nothing can break that seal. The promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance unto the redemption of those who are God's possession, to the praise of his glory, speaking of the new heavens and the new earth. So we see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit at work in our salvation. So why does the church exist? Now let's pause. One of the things that we're trying to recapture here at Transformation Church is the ancient beauty of what it means to be the ecclesia. That's the Greek word for church. That word was used by the Roman government and Christians stole it. An ecclesia was any group that had a purpose together that bonded them. And so the early Christians said, you know what? We're the true ecclesia because we used to be in darkness and now we're in the marvelous light. And in this family is every kind of people. So why does this ecclesia exists. And so what we want to do here at Transformation Church is we want to recapture that. Sometimes people will say to me, you know what, pastor, we need to go back to the early church. I go, that's impossible. We don't have a time machine. We got cell phones. We got cars. Can I tell you a funny story? Now, a part of it, I wasn't, I was a little bit of a jerk of source. So I repent. I was speaking at this event at Hilton Head. And this one dude came in, he's a white guy. He was dressed like what he thought Jesus would look like. He had on white bed sheets with a beard. Um, so he came in and he was, he, was, he was like, well, I'm the only man on the earth who's actually doing what Jesus did. I was like, oh, okay. So that's when I got a little feisty in my soul. I was younger then, I wouldn't do it now. <laughs> and so after he did his spill, 
I was talking to him, and I was like, so what do you do when you're out on the streets? Like, I just talk to people. I go, well, do you call them to repentance? And he's like, well, they already know they're sinners. I'm like, well, Jesus called people to repentance. And so anyway, we're talking. He goes, hey, can I use your phone? And I I wanted to go, Jesus didn't have a phone. (laughs) I let him use my phone, of course. But here's my point, though. God's people and its purpose never changes. But the form of how it is expressed does according to the context. Does that make sense? So churches in different parts of the world may express and look differently, but what we're concerned about is the function and the purpose of it. We're trying to be a New Testament church as best we can. So why does the church exist? The church, and by the way, the church is people, not a building. But coming to a building to be equipped is a good thing. Because people will say, well, I ain't got to go to no church to have a relationship with Jesus. Well, I ain't got to go home to be with my wife to have a relationship with her. It won't be very good, though. Did y'all catch that one? I'll be like, Vicky, I ain't coming. Child, please. Y'all be reading about Derwin Gray found on a lake <laughs> with a javelin through his heart. We have no idea how that happened. He wasn't coming home. But that's what people, well, I don't need to go to church. It's not so much about what you get out of it, it's what you bring to it, your prayers, your presence. The church exists because of God's triunity. God the Father has a multi-ethnic people. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, if you want to have some fun, write down Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. And this is exactly how God describes the children of Israel with the same language. It says, but you are a chosen race. Guess who he's talking to, people? Jews and Gentiles. Now remember, this is like... Man, this is probably A.D. 55, 60. The church is spreading through northern Africa. Um, Wasn't until Acts 16 that it began to, uh, 14, 16, to begin to go to Europe. By the way, the first convert on the European continent was a lady named Lydia. She had a business selling purple clothing, which means sister girl has some money, and then she planted a church in her own house. That's impressive for back then. But your chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. So this is how he's describing the people of God, just the way it was described in Exodus 19, 5 and 6, a people, there's the people, a people for his possession. Ooh, let me preach just for a minute. God's possession. And there's no pressure to perform or pretend. There's no pressure to perform or pretend. You belong to the only one who absolutely, 100% knows you, and he died for you anyway. Why does he do it? Why does he do it? Why does he give us all this goodness? So that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So we see that the Father has a people, and the Son has a multi-ethnic bride. The Father's always wanted a people, and the Son has wanted a bride. One of the things throughout the Bible, we see with Adam and Eve, a marriage, we see throughout the history of the nation of Israel, God calls Israel his wife, and then we see Jesus has the bride of Christ, which includes men and women. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Uh, We don't really have time to get into that, but I don't want to leave any questions. This does not mean women are a walking mat, you do whatever. No, because two verses before that, it says submit to one another. The word submit means to come alongside and to partner with. It doesn't mean you're second string and you just exist to help your husband out. We are co-heirs in Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord because the husband is the head of the wife. You're like, see, woman, I'm the head. Now watch this. As Christ is the head of the church, he is the savior of the body. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives are to submit to their husbands in everything. Now watch this. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. I promise you, men, if you loved 
your wife like Jesus loved the church, you're going to make great decisions. She's going to know she's cared for. She can trust you. You won't have issues. Because there's a lot of men. Woman, the Bible say you need to do what I say. Well, you need to keep reading, homeboy. Like, just keep on going, keep on going. That if I'm loving and serving my wife, and I have the mind of Christ, the patience of Christ, the kindness of Christ, the goodness of Christ, if I treat her one-tenth of the way Jesus has treated me, we won't have issues. And besides, I'll value her mind and her gifting and her strength. My wife is so much smarter than me in so many areas. Why in the world would God give me a gift like that not to say, hey, babe, what do you think about this? You guys ever see Coming to America? The first one? You remember when James Earl Jones wanted uh, Eddie Murphy to get married and they had a woman for him to marry? And he was like, so what do you like? She was like, whatever you like. <laughs> no, no, what do you want to do with your life? Whatever you want me to do. Friends, that's not a relationship. A relationship is two co-equal people submitting to the grace and love of God and pouring that out on one another. Okay, turn into a marriage seminar. And we're talking about the Trinity. To make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. He did this to present the church. Now he's talking about us. Teenagers, listen to this. To present the church to himself in splendor. You ever see a... a a bride-to-be walk down the aisle and everybody stands up? Well, that's the way Jesus adores us because he's put us in splendor. Listen, without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless. What if we saw what God sees? It would change everything. God, the Holy Spirit, also indwells a multi-ethnic people. The Father has a people, the Son has a bride, and the Holy Spirit has a temple to dwell in. Don't you yourselves know that you are God's temple and that the Spirit of God lives in you? Wow. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy, and that is what you are. Ooh, we. That is what you are. That is what you are. Let the, let the third person of the Trinity talk to you, teenagers. That's who you are. Not, 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 not people hating on you on, on the little Twitter machine or the Instagram machine or the tick. No, no. You are who God says you are. God is not a liar. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have spoken, and it is true. You have been sealed with the Spirit. You are the bride of Christ. You are a possession of the Father. That's who you are. Sometimes you got to tell your feelings. Listen, you can talk if you want to, but I ain't believing it. We are to be baptized in the name, singular, of the Father, Son, and the Spirit, plural. This is a part of our vision statement here at Transformation Church. We are a mission-shaped church. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all ethnos, all ethnic groups. Now, when you read this, let us not have chronological snobbery. What that means is we read it from a short period of time and go, yeah, let's go send missionaries over there. I was speaking to um, a church planning director in Norway, God is opening up all types of doors to be able to influence in Europe. And in talking to him, a Brazilian pastor said, we're sending 100,000 Brazilian teenagers and 20-somethings to Europe to reach Europe. Nigerians are sending Nigerians to America as missionaries. The church is shrinking in America is very shrunken in Europe, and it is on fire in Latin America, on fire in Africa. By 2050, one in three people will be a, one in three Christians will be a Nigerian woman. Southeast Asia growing. The fastest conversion rate in the world right now is in Iran. 
The fastest conversion rate is in Iran. The fastest church growth we've ever seen in the history of Christianity is in communist China. Can you believe it? They didn't even have a Democrat or Republican as president. And communist China. So reason why we're mission-shaped is because we got other countries sending missionaries here. So, so we, only, we, we don't just go across the sea. We, grow, we go across the street, too. The nations are here. New York City's coming to a neighborhood near you. Baptizing them in the name, singular, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, plural. And teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I am with you to the very end of the age. Why does the triunity, the trinity matter? Because we live and move and have our being in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And in the words of the philosopher Forrest Gump, that's all I got to say about that, and we can have some Q&A now. So we just jumped in a little bit. Now that we're all good and confused, it'll just be awesome. <laughs> thank you, Pastor Derwin. Can we just clap and thank Pastor Derwin for his teaching tonight? Thank you. Are you tired? You know what? It's been a long day, yeah. <laughs> it's been a long day. So, yeah. all right. Well, we're, like you said, we'll just jump right into it. it. As I said earlier, when you all submitted your forms, you had an opportunity to ask questions. So if you didn't submit a question, I'm sorry, but, you know, hopefully you can glean from the questions of others. Um, so we will start with this one. Okay. Um, why is the doctrine of the Trinity not apparent in the Old Testament? I know you did refer to the mm -hmm. Old Testament, but why doesn't it say explicitly, I guess, Father, Son, Spirit? Um, I believe that it does, and I wrote a 30-page paper for you, <laughs> so you'll be able to read it and find it. Um, I think one of the reasons why we don't think it is taught explicitly is because we as Protestant evangelicals don't know what to do with the Old Testament. And so we're kind of like, uh, getting my doctorate in the New Testament helped me understand the Old Testament so much more. Most of the New Testament is simply quotations of the Old Testament reoriented around the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the fulfillment of everything in the Old Testament. And so in the Old Testament, we do see shadows and glimpses of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Like we see the Ruach of God, the, the, the Spirit of God would, would come upon a person. The Spirit of God gave the a, a, a craftsman ability to make the um, Ark of the Covenant. And we see in creation, we even see in the name Elohim, we see in the um, angel of the Lord, the pre-incarnate Christ. And so I do believe that it is taught explicitly. But one of the problems that we as preachers do is a lot of preachers are afraid to teach doctrinally. We're not. I don't want to just give you... Uh, um, a dynamic message, I want you to be able to take truth with you so that you can absorb it and understand it and make it your own. And so a lot of times people don't teach doctrine. They try to teach motivation, but the greatest motivation is to know who God is and what God has done for us. Um, I actually had a mentor of mine years ago before I even started writing books. And he said, if you go into a bookstore, like a Christian bookstore, he goes, all the good books are in the back. I go, what do you mean? He goes, all the theology books are in the back. They put the other books up front. He goes, if you ever write a book, the more theological it is, the less it'll sell. I'm like, well, guess I ain't gonna be selling a lot of books then. Awesome, thank you. So we had a few people ask this question. Um, they, they're asking if you can explain John 14, 28. So I'll read it for everyone. John 14, 28 says, you have heard me tell you I am going away and I am coming to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father because the Father is greater than I. So the question is, is there a hierarchy in the Trinity? Number one, there is no hierarchy in the Trinity. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are equal. 
I can see how people would say there's a hierarchy, but we have to understand when Jesus wrote those words, or when he said those words, that's the incarnation. We're going to cover that next week. Incarnation is a Latin word. It means put on flesh. And so Jesus, who's eternally God the Son, when he became a man, he's doing the will of the Father to redeem humanity. Thus, the Father is greater than I. Jesus was not taking direction on his own. So like next week, we'll co- we will cover this. But Jesus, as a human being, the Bible says he's the last Adam. What Adam was supposed to be, Jesus is. What Jesus is in his humanity is what salvation moves us to become. Everybody, does that make sense? There was an ancient uh, church father, his name is Athanasius. His nickname was the Black Dwarf because he was from Alexandria, Egypt, and he was a very dark African. And his proponents would make fun of him, and he spent like years in prison. And one of the things that he wrote is, God became like us so we could become like him, meaning Jesus, God the Son, became a man so that we could become like he is in a man. So sanctification, or growing as a Christian, is actually the restoring of our humanity. Jesus is what humanity looks like at its best. But Jesus is also the living portrait of the invisible God. If you want to know what humanity was supposed to be, look at Jesus. If you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, so the Bible says that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. What does this mean? And are there like three thrones in heaven? What's going on there? What's happening? Great question. So when the Bible says that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God, there's a couple of things that's happening. Number one is vindication, that Jesus is who he said he is. So I'm going to go through a few names here. He's the seed of Abraham who gives Abraham the family. He is the Lamb of God. He is the great high priest. He is the mercy seat. He is Lord God and King. So when he raises from the dead, he goes and he sits on his throne and all of heaven and all of creation goes, yep, he did what he said he was going to do. To be at the right hand of the Father is a Hebraic idiom that means equal honor to, because God the Father doesn't have a right hand. There are some um, non-Orthodox views in Christianity where, uh, I, you know, where, where they would say, well, no, God is a man. And it's like, no, God cannot be a man. God is an infinite being. And so can you imagine like an infinite hand? You can't have an infinite hand. Infinitude has to be spaceless, has to be spirit. And so to be at his right hand means Jesus is who he said he was. He conquered sin, death, and evil. He is praying and interceding for us. And his seatedness means the work is done. Salvation has been achieved. So this was probably our most popular question, and the people want to know, when we pray, who do we address? Does it matter? First of all, pray. (laughs) (laughs) So one of the things that I do in my books is I, and if you notice when I pray before services, whenever I pray, I will combine Father, Son, and Spirit. Number one The Father, Son, and Spirit are not competing. So if you pray to the Holy Spirit, it's not neglecting the Father, the Son. I like to pray Trinitarian prayers. So if you read my books, I have a prayer to the Father, I have a prayer to the Son, I have a prayer to the Holy Spirit. Sometimes I'll just pray to Christ. Mm -hmm. And so the main thing is you pray, but God the Father isn't going to go, I cannot believe you didn't say my name in that prayer. Um, So what I would say is develop your own rhythms. Like, I love praying, like, Holy Spirit, you are the giver of life. Reveal Jesus to us. 
That's what the Holy Spirit, he loves to reveal Jesus. He loves to open our eyes. He loves to give us gifts. When the Bible says the Spirit of Christ is talking about the Holy Spirit, that the Father, Son, and Spirit all live in us. It's the fruit of the Spirit. It's abiding in Christ. It's being united to the Father through the Son. And so the answer is yes, pray. I love that because there's so much freedom in that. I think sometimes we get overly concerned or try to make something legalistic when really the Bible just says to pray. And we don't have to be so concerned about getting it right, but God sees our hearts. Yeah, and, and um, one of the beautiful things too is um, God spoke and the world came into being. So the longer your prayers are, doesn't mean God is like, woo, I'm going to do something now. <clears throat> Reading scripture has been the best thing for me. All throughout the day, I'll pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of our sins. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I'll pray it all throughout the day because in that prayer, it covers everything. Like, do you ever feel like when you pray, like, okay, I got to say the right thing, and I got to figure this out, and we spend more time trying to dissect what we need to pray about versus going, Lord, your will be done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> like, Lord, your will be done. That's the best prayer you could ever pray. <laughs> Okay, so if the Holy Trinity is one, why do we seek or cherish each one separately? Or do we seek and cherish each one separately? Um, I would imagine some people probably do, but God is patient. I think if you come from a more charismatic background, it's like, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. Um, if you come from more of a Bible background, it's like the word, Jesus, Jesus. If you come from more of like a reform, it's sovereignty, sovereignty, sovereignty. And it's like, why not all three? And one of the, one of the reasons why I've chosen for us to be a non-denominational community of faith is because I want to draw on the richness of, first and foremost, the Bible, New Testament, but also throughout the beauty and diversity within the body of Christ. And so we shouldn't have a hierarchy within the triunity of God. We should patiently um, learn. And I would say of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the least known is God, the Holy Spirit. And what I would say is just take time to read. And I know for some people like, oh, Holy Spirit. Guys, God, the Holy Spirit is not weird. He's a God of order, not a God of chaos. And listen, I've seen people fall down and roll around and then go watch porn. I've seen people sit in a chair and it doesn't look like they're engaged and they're godly, humble, and holy. So if you want to know if the Holy Spirit is active in your life, you're growing in love, joy, peace, patience, Kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. That's the fruit, fruit, fruit of the Spirit. You're growing in the gifts of the Spirit. We're going to talk about this in week three, but I'll go ahead now. For some reason, we think the Holy Spirit is limited to three gifts, healing, tongues, and prophecy. There's also the gift of giving. <laughs> There's the gift of administration. Uh, there's the gift of leadership the gift of mercy, it goes on and on and on and on. But whatever gifts God gives you, it's for you to edify and build up the church, not for yourself. Thank you. So we're going to have one last question. And this is, um, you know, so most of us here are believers or followers of Christ, and so we experience the Trinity and your teaching in a certain way. But when we engage with our friends who are non-believers, mm -hmm. what is the best way to describe the Trinity to them? Well, I'm assuming within the question that you have a relationship. Mm -hmm. And because you have a relationship, you've built up some relational currency. Um, if an unbeliever asks you about the Trinity, first and foremost, I'd be like, that is awesome. <laughs> and then what I would do is take your notes and walk them through certain passages of the Bible. In my experience, the triangle 
visually has helped people get a picture of like, okay, I can see how three can be one. The other thing that's difficult too is when we say person, you're a person, I'm a person. But when we say God has three persons, it's not persons like us, even though Jesus became a human person. So it was St. Augustine, another North African early church father, who, by the way, he was a wild pagan. This dude was wild. He tried a bunch of other religions, and he was fed up, and he heard a voice that says, pick up and read. And he picked up his Bible, and he opened it up to Romans 13, 14, and it says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will not give in to the temptations of your flesh. And he was converted at that moment because he couldn't stop himself sexually. He was just out of control like it was in that time. But that done something to him. What was that? What was that? What was I talking about? <laughs> Explaining the Trinity to Oh, yeah, to your friend. Yeah, yeah. So my point is this. <laughs> my point is this is it also takes faith to understand. But God doesn't ask you to blindly believe. He gives you echoes of light to continue to follow. But what I would say is just share um, what, what you have. Don't be afraid of hard questions. So God in his grace, for some reason, decided, Derwin, you're going to study under Norman Geisler, uh, the late Norman Geisler. He wrote over 100 books. He was the modern day uh, philosopher, apologist, and like we became friends. And so I was trained in how to debate. It's called Christian apologetics. It doesn't mean you apologize. It's the Greek word apologia, and it's a word that lawyers use to give a defense. Mm -hmm. And so you build relationship, and if someone asks you a question you don't know, like, for example, you know, uh, Jesus says the Father and I are one. Well, how can they be one if they're two? You go, man, that's a hard question. Well, let's study it together and find out. Or you could just say, well, the Father is not the Son and the Son is not the Father, but they share the same being or essence. Mm -hmm. We as Christians believe in one God who reveals himself through three persons. Mm -hmm. One illustration that has helped me over the last 20 years a lot is the first question I ask you. Why do we long for love and community? Mm -hmm. And then I get into, well, God, the Father's the lover, the Son is the love, and the Holy Spirit is the spirit of love. Because you're made in the image of God, mm -hmm. you want to experience that love because you were created by love, from love, to love. Yeah. And if you're just one person eternally, who's there to love? I'm not picking on Islam. The difficulty with Allah is he is sovereign will because mm -hmm. he's existed by himself. You are a chess piece on Allah's board, whereas our God existed in a community of love and the invitation of salvation is, I want you to experience what we've experienced. It's, it's like being invited to the greatest party ever, mm -hmm. which, by the way, is some of the illustrations that Jesus uses in the New Testament mm -hmm. of feasts wedding feasts and all types of stuff. Awesome. Well, thank you, Pastor Derwin. Can we once again just thank Pastor Derwin for giving his time to me?